From Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our television and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. I'm David Weston. President-elect Joe Biden unveiled his plan last night seeking $1.9 trillion from Congress for immediate relief for the U.S. economy. I spoke with Larry Summers, but first we're going to hear actually, I think, from President-elect Biden, are we not? Okay, we were going to play for you a little bit of what President-elect Biden had to say, but instead of that, we're going to go to Larry Summers, because just a short time ago, I got to talk to former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers for his reaction to what President-elect Biden has proposed. This is probably the boldest economic proposal since the Great Society, and perhaps the boldest economic proposal uh, since uh, the New Deal. One way to look at it is uh, this. In 2009, the incoming Obama administration proposed a fiscal plan that represented, filled perhaps 40% of the output gap. This plan would be perhaps three times as large as the output gap. So relative to the size of the economic problem, we're talking about something more than five times uh, as uh, large. And that reflects a conviction that's surely right that too little was done in 2008, but 2009, but five times is a lot. It also reflects a interesting and I think important desire to combine the macroeconomic element with the structural fairness uh, element. And so these would be historic reductions in uh, child poverty if achieved through uh, the child care credit. Um, I think that the most important pieces of this package are the reinforcement of the vaccination effort and the support for uh, state and local uh, governments. I think the question about uh, this package is going to be how the macroeconomics add up and here, I think it's important to understand that this was probably as much an attempt to frame a debate that's going to come as it was a proposal to be implemented in its literal form. And so I don't think the right question is whether this package would overheat the economy. I think if it were passed as written, it would overheat uh, the economy. But will this shift the debate towards our doing more? Will this shift the debate uh, towards doing more for those who've been left behind? And I think there, uh, the answer is yes. But we are gonna have to watch this economy very carefully. And I do think the conventional wisdom is underestimating the risks of hitting capacity and if we do anything approaching this, we are going to be managing the economy with the accelerator more on the floor than at any time in peacetime uh, history. So, 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 Larry, you say it frames the debate. Do we have time for that debate? Does the economy have time for that debate? Because there's going to be, in all likelihood, a back and forth. It doesn't look like, as you suggest, the Republicans are just going to say yes. Some moderate Democrats might not say yes. If this takes three months or more, could there be longer term structural damage to the economy? Do we need some things done right now? I think the three, three or four months would be a long time. But I think that's why it's so important that uh, the incoming administration worked with uh, the, all the actors to get a $900 billion package passed uh, just a month ago. That $900 billion package in and of itself, given that it was all gonna run over three to six months, is far larger than the fiscal stimulus we had in 2008. And so I think this does give us a little bit of time to uh, work this out. 
Larry, you mentioned the money going to be given to people. Part of this package is $1,400 more to individuals. That takes it up to that $2,000 magic number. We have talked about that before. You've expressed some skepticism whether it makes sense. We have various anecdotes about some people do need that money. Some people, frankly, don't. They've kept their jobs. They've kept their employment. Uh, do you believe that this may be a risk to this package, ironically one that may be more politically palatable, including to some Republicans? Look, I, by my lights, the $1,400 that would go to my children um, is not an attractive use of uh, public money. On the other hand, its universality serves to make it more attractive. And the authors of this package have put in a variety of other things that are tilted very much towards the poor, the refundable child uh, tax credit, for example. But I think we're saying the same thing, David, which is the risks here are on the side of we're of just doing so much on such a scale to give money to people in a way that isn't completely targeted, that that may use up space that could have been used for much more fundamental and important investments. That was part of my interview with former U.S. Treasury Secretary Larry Summers. You can hear more of it on Wall Street Week. That's airing tonight at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. We're going to be joined by Afsani Beshlas of the Rock Creek Group and Jillian Tett with the Financial Times. Once again, that will be 6 p.m. this evening on Bloomberg Television and Radio. But now let's get a check on the markets, which Kayla lines. And Kayla, as far as I can tell, the markets are not terribly excited by what they heard last night from the president-elect. I don't think the markets are terribly excited about much of anything today, David. We are looking at a red day for equities really across the board. There could be a couple factors at work here. One is it is a Friday before holiday weekend could be a little bit of taking risk off the table. But then, of course, you also had earnings season not off to a great start when looking at the big banks, City, JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, all reporting, none of which were greeted kindly by the market for City. You had that miss on fixed sales and trading for Wells Fargo, another one billion dollar charge that is taking the KBW bank index down by about three and a half percent today. Then on top of all of that, we know financial have been part of that reflation trade and that reflation trade really broadly is unwinding today. The Russell 2000 is down by about 1.7 percent right now and then again energy and financials uh, really leading declines within the S&P 500 and that is where that stimulus conversation comes in David. It seems that Biden's uh, announcement unveiling of that 1.9 trillion dollar plan yesterday turned into a bit of a sell the news event. The market was expecting that or something like it but now maybe concerns are starting to percolate about the likelihood that a deal of that size actually can be done and at what timeline uh, it actually can get done. Underscoring the need for stimulus, of course, David, is a slew of economic data we got today. We got a number of points, but the one real standout is retail sales that disappointed to the downside in a big way, falling seven tenths of one percent. Economists were expecting it to be flat in the month of December, plus the month of November was also revised lower and you had uh, Michigan consumer sentiment coming in a little bit weaker than estimated. So it reveals some concern on the part of the consumer as the virus continues to rage and there is not yet more stimulus on the way, David. OK, thank Thank you so much, Kayla Lyons, for that report on the markets. Coming up here, American business was rocked like the rest of us by the attack on the Capitol. We're going to talk with the head of Boston Consulting Group, Rich Lesser, about how American business responds. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. For Bloomberg First Word News, we go now to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. Federal prosecutors say that rioters who invaded the Capitol last week planned to capture and assassinate elected officials. That was in a court filing for a case involving an Arizona man who authorities want to keep in custody. They say the man left a note for Vice President Pence saying, quote, it's only a matter of time. Justice is coming, end quote. President-elect Biden will have more to say this afternoon about his plans to speed up the vaccine rollout. His $20 billion plan is part of a broader $1.9 trillion coronavirus relief proposal he announced last night. Bloomberg has learned that Mr. Biden's team wants to build further public confidence in the safety and effectiveness of the vaccines. 
The British Prime Minister Boris Johnson has been briefing the media on the coronavirus. He says all UK travel corridors will close from 4 a.m. local time on Monday. He also says over 3.2 million people have been given the vaccine in the country. Italy plans to tighten lockdown restrictions on most of the country. Officials say the on-again, off-again curbs haven't prevented a resurgence of the coronavirus. Italy imposed a nationwide lockdown in the spring that closed all non-essential businesses, tightly limited movement, and crippled the economy. Prime Minister Giuseppe Conte is also facing confidence votes in the parliament next week. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. Thank you so much, Mark. What happened at the Capitol last week was not just a crisis for the Constitution. It also posed some difficult questions for American business. For some initial thoughts on how it responded and what it should do next, we welcome now Rich Lesser. He's Boston Consulting Group CEO. Rich, thanks so much for being with us. We want to talk about the stimulus package. But before that, you wrote a very powerful note in, in, in the immediate aftermath, actually, of that attack on the Capitol, in which you said the most important thing is we never forget. How does that apply if I'm a CEO of a major company? Well, it's a pleasure to be with you, David. Uh, look, the attacks that we saw last week, it's hard to remember in our lifetimes a similar event happening. You really have to go back, uh, you know, a, lo a long time to find anything even similar. And, and business leaders care deeply about the strength of our democracy, the legitimacy of constitutional processes, including elections, and the undermining that took place to incite the attack on the Capitol to support that to claim election fraud. And I think uh, in general believe we need to reinforce principles, constitutional elements, democratic processes. We can't forget it. Otherwise we risk having it reoccur. You deal with CEOs, C-suites, members of the boards of directors of major companies around the world all the time. We can think back to four years ago when there was a real embracing by President Trump as the new as new president of American business and a lot of CEOs going to the White House and really spending time with him. As American business looks at President Biden now as he's about to take office next Wednesday, what thoughts do you have about how they deal with President Biden and his administration maybe differently from President Trump? I actually think um, many business leaders will want to look for paths uh, to work together with the new administration, partly to reinforce the strength of the country, given the events that we've seen recently, and partially because there's the potential for a shared agenda on really important elements, investing in infrastructure, climate, addressing the digital divide, ad addressing education and opportunity, particularly to deal with racial equity issues, but also more broadly, immigration. There's a large space where, and trade, of course, where we need some stability and to keep moving forward. And, and, and on all of those elements, there's room for overlap and a shared agenda. And of course, there'll be pressures on both sides to uh, adopt more, uh, uh, extreme positions and not be willing to compromise. But I think business will be looking for the opportunities to push ahead on those agendas. Rich, you're dealing strategy for corporations. Give us a sense on the strategic issue. You talked about overlap. It's like a Venn diagram. There's some overlap, but they're not the same agendas. No corporation is going to have the same agenda as an administration in Washington. How do you advise a CEO and the senior management of a company to make sure they find that overlap, embrace that where our uh, agenda aligns, but you don't get sucked in, if I can use that term, sucked into going too far into what the administration wants, but might not be best for your long-term vision for your company. Yes, I, I think that is the, the challenge that many business leaders face. What we would advise is find elements around policies where there's opportunities to work together and actively do that. Um, state where you disagree, that's fine but not use the disagreements as, in, as, as a roadblock to working together to move the country forward on places where there is the potential for agreement. And I think we, we, we saw that even in the last administration that was clearly so much more difficult because so much of the rhetoric and language was so hostile to the values in many companies that, that I think having tried to find ways to work together, um, most ended up trying to just create distance. But I think there's another opportunity again, very different leadership a different time, and and it's the right thing to try to look for the places where where progress can be made together. 
we've been talking about the administration and the president, but of course there are connections between most major corporations and members of Congress as well, Senate and House. They have business up there. They need relations with these people. They need to talk to them about it. Talk about political contributions, because this has always been a dicey issue. I must say, back in the olden days when I was at Cap City's ABC, there was always an issue about making contributions to people up on the Hill, because you can't just ignore these people. You have to work with them. At the same time, you're sometimes asked to contribute to some people you might not necessarily agree with. I, I think that's always been true, as you said, David, but I think what we saw happen uh, last week has raised that to a different level. And the votes that were taken immediately after the uh, attack on the Capitol has just put much more um, pressure, but also reflection inside uh, many boardrooms and executive rooms uh, about what is the right response. And we see it in the and the announcements that Dow and Marriott and Walmart have taken and, and the pausing for reflection that we've seen from PepsiCo and, and J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, I, I think people look at the 147 congressional leaders who voted uh, to object to the certification of the election right after our democracy and our capital had been attacked and are really trying to think through what signals to send and what to do. And I suspect that reflection is going to continue for a while. I don't think I don't think uh, we're beyond that. And we won't be for a while because our investigation's underway. We don't know what else we're going to learn in the weeks ahead. Putting aside the issues of the attack and of the impeachment and the proceedings there, whatever they may be, a, a big issue, obviously, for Congress is going to be this, uh, I will call it massive, a stimulus package that President-elect Biden is proposing, $1.9 trillion. Uh, as you advise CEOs and leadership of companies, uh, where do you see alignment there of interest? What, what is in that package that makes the most sense for business and therefore for the economy overall, do you think? Well, yeah, it's a very important point. The, the business roundtable that I'm quite uh, closely involved with, but many others as well, have talked passionately since July about the need for the federal government to invest, first and foremost, to invest to get vaccines out as fast as effectively as possible, to protect the vulnerable, those that are health vulnerable, but those that are also uh, vulnerable in their communities to help them get past this and help shelter in place when it needs to be, to help deal with education issues, both in the classroom and addressing the digital divide and to provide support for the unemployed and those who are affected here and small businesses. Unfortunately, given the rapid reacceleration of, of the pandemic across the country, those needs are going to continue and continue for a while as we roll out the vaccine. So I think the business community has been and will be supportive of continued federal government action. Of course, $1.9 trillion is a, is a huge package, and I'm sure that that will be subject to negotiation. And I suspect uh, most business leaders haven't come to a view on whether a number that big is what's required, but certainly a, a substantial support. I think there'd be broad alignment around. We need to keep the economy going. We need to protect the vulnerable. We need to get vaccines into people's arms as fast as we can. Coming up shortly in this program, we're going to talk with the CEO of Honeywell about a project they have going on in North Carolina, actually, to team with the government officials down there, but also, actually, David Tepper, who owns the local sports team, the Carolina Panthers, uh, for a vaccination campaign. Uh, do you see, as you talk to various companies around the country, are there other private-public partnerships that can help that vaccination thing beyond just appropriating money, which is what uh, President-elect Biden is talking about? I believe there's a lot to do. Now, we're at a very early stage of the vaccine rollout. So right now, we're focused on a small subset of people that will grow rapidly over time. Uh, and, and so I think what business should say and do to encourage people uh, is, is, at this early stage, a bit more challenging. I think as we get further along, business is looking for opportunities to step up, supported by the government, fully in line with health authorities, of course, but to encourage people to get vaccinated, to to provide support where it's appropriate and where they're requested to do so by government to make to facilitate that process. I think we'll see a lot of interest by business to help. But of course, in a pandemic, you first take your guidance from health authorities and government authorities on what, what they're asking you to do. And, and we're in the early stage. And frankly, with a change in administration, we may see that evolve quite substantially in the weeks ahead. So finally, and briefly here, if we can, Rich, uh, do you find companies looking out past the vaccine right now as they plan their strategy? Absolutely. I think most companies think by the third quarter of the year, hopefully, maybe the fourth quarter, we can, if we do this really well, and that's a big if, we can be beyond this. 
and there's opportunities to rebuild the economy strongly, create opportunity. The role of technology we've seen grow dramatically. The importance of climate is coming to the fore in a big way. I think all those elements are top of minds for business leaders as we look beyond the pandemic, but we have to get beyond the pandemic. That's job one in the near term. Yeah, that's well said. Thank you so much. Always great to talk with you. That's Rich Lesser. He's Boston Consulting Group CEO. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. It is time now for our stocks of the hour. J.P. Morgan, Citi, and Wells Fargo. They started out their, uh, the unofficial start of the fourth quarter earnings season this morning. We welcome now Bloomberg's Wall Street reporter, Shanali Basak, to give us an overview. So, Shanali, what did we find out? It looks like one bad, one good and two not so good. Uh, that's exactly right. For J.P. Morgan, you have a record quarter of profitability here. But, of course, nobody trades on yesterday's news. They're always looking forward to what's tomorrow. And you have a lot of risks ahead for the big banks. Even though Jamie Dimon is looking forward to a better second quarter, he says that if the vaccine rollout stumbles or other risks starts to arise, you, like all of this can be completely uh, unraveled. So, but barring that, we can see market levels hold strong. The question is, is can they make as much money in the big investment banking businesses as they had last year? Of course, in the consumer business, we're still seeing pressure on net interest income for them, Citigroup, and for Wells Fargo, which we know still has that asset cap, David. Yeah, at the same time, J.P. Morgan is just extraordinary. I heard you this morning on, on radio and TV, and it was pretty extraordinary. Jamie Dimon, though, is still looking for some threat out there, and I guess he's finding some potential competition in China is he? You always have to look around the corner, right, David? He said he's terrified of financial technology that's here in the U.S. And he said that, yes, that China, the big technology giants, can make bigger inroads in the U.S. over the longer horizon, over the next several years as well. In the near term, some of these fintechs, though, they're getting very big. You know, Stripe, in their most recent funding round, can become as big or bigger than Goldman Sachs itself. At the same time, there's a transition going on at City. What did uh, Michael Corbett leave behind for his successor? Well, it was great. Today, we actually heard from Jane Frazier on the call, and analysts couldn't ask her questions fast enough. The first couple questions really directed at Jane Frazier, what her strategy is moving forward. You know, of course, they are able to resume buybacks. That's something to hold on to. However, the way they will spend their capital on growth and how to remain competitive themselves is still a big question mark. Uh, but we can expect digital investments there as well. Uh, at the same time, Wells Fargo just keeps to trying to get out from under the pressure. I, I can't believe it. This morning, I, you can't think of how many ways an analyst can ask the same question about an asset cap. Until that is clear from their horizon, it will be harder for Charlie Sharp to create a growth story. But he did say that a lot of his changes are underway. Okay, thank you so much to Shanley Vasek for the report on the banks. Coming up, we're going to talk with this Honeywell CEO. He's Darius Adamczyk about what he's doing on vaccination. This is Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. For Bloomberg First Word News, we're going out to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. Heightened security concerns are forcing a delay in President-elect Biden's inaugural preparations. The acting Deputy Homeland Security Secretary Ken Cusinelli tells CNN the rehearsal for the inaugural ceremony will be held on Monday due to what he calls online chatter around the original rehearsal date on Sunday. Cusinelli says there are no specific credible threats. Meantime, the Associated Press reports that President Trump will leave Washington Wednesday before the inauguration. The inspectors general for the Justice Department and Pentagon are joining with other government watchdogs in looking at their agency's preparations for and response to last week's attack on the Capitol. Justice Inspector General Michael Horowitz says the review will look for any weaknesses in DOJ protocols, policies, or procedures. Officials have engaged in finger pointing on the failure to anticipate the riot and the time it took for National Guard to respond. New York City is running out of coronavirus vaccines. Mayor Bill de Blasio told WNYC the city's supply will be gone by next week. He said the city doesn't get a serious supply of doses. He will have to freeze the appointment system. 
De Blasio says that would be, quote, insane after all the progress we've made, end quote. The city has only administered 42% of the 800,000 doses that it has in its arsenal. That's according to city data. The family of a Libyan convicted in the 1988 Lockerbie bombing has lost an appeal in Scotland to have his conviction overturned posthumously. Abdel Basset El Megrahi was convicted of mass murder for the attack on Pan Am Flight 103. The bombing killed all 259 people aboard the plane and another 11 on the ground. Al Megrahi was freed in 2009 on compassionate grounds because he was terminally ill. He died in Libya in 2012. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. Thank you very much, Mark. President-elect Biden's stimulus plan includes billions for the program to get vaccines into more people's arms more quickly, a recognition that we are not doing nearly well enough yet. But it's not just the government that can address the challenges. Honeywell has put together a public-private partnership in North Carolina to get the jab done faster and more effectively, teaming with state officials, David Tepper, the owner of the Carolina Panthers, and the head of the health care provider, Atrium. To take us through the program, we welcome now Chairman and CEO of Honeywell, Adam Adamczyk. So, Mr. Adamczyk, thank you so much for being with us. Give us a sense of what you're doing and maybe even as interestingly, where it came from. Well, thank you, David. Uh, thanks for having me on the, on the broadcast. Um, where it really came from initially was, you know, myself, just like many other U.S. citizens, were looking at the data, particularly around the number of vaccines that have been distributed versus the number that have actually been administered into people's arms. There's a pretty great disparity. I mean, we have something like 30, 31 million vaccines that have been distributed, yet only roughly about 11 million that have been administered. And you know, instead of complaining about it, um, we Honeywell wanted to, to do something about it. And you know, we partnered with a couple of great institutions in the Panthers and Atrium Health and with David Tepper and Gene Woods who lead those organizations. And uh, we want to open up a mass vaccination center in Charlotte at Bank of America Stadium. And we're also very proud to, to partner with the Motor Speedway. We're going to do a little bit of a pilot run uh, next weekend there. So. Uh, so kind of trying to help and, and get these vaccinations into people's arms as quickly as we possibly can. So, Jerry, I mean, Honeywell really is a master of logistics. As you've put the numbers to this thing, what kind of capacity do you think you can get up to? What kind of rate do you think you can do inoculations? Well, our, our goal is to get a million vaccines administered by July. Uh, I'm optimistic, so we're going to achieve on that uh, perspective, <laughs> on that goal. But, but you know, we've got some work to do. We're about three, four days into that effort. We're in the middle of modeling the flow and, and, um, and the queue systems and making sure that we have a balanced line of people moving through. And we're working through all the logistics. And we hope to open up in roughly about two weeks' time the BOB Center for uh, mass vaccination center. So, so we... Give us a sense of how it's likely to work. If I'm down in that area, do I call in? Do I go online to register? And by the way, what happens if I don't show up? Yeah, that's those are all great questions, and we're working through all of those. And I, and I think we have to be as flexible as we can. So we think we have to have an avenue where you can sign up online. We have, an, have to have an avenue where you call in. For a lot of our seniors, they're more used to calling. Some of the, uh, our, our uh, other citizens would prefer to uh, go online. So we're going to have both of those options open. We're going to have a... We're anticipating having a drive-through capability as well as a walk-up capability. And the thing that can't happen is we can't waste a single dose of the vaccine. So we're probably going to over-schedule a little, a little bit just to make sure that we don't actually scrap any vaccines because that's the biggest crime of all. And frankly, we have to create a demand problem and not have a supply problem, which is where we are today. Yeah, that would be it. That would be the day. I hope you get to that day. Uh, give us a sense. This is not done for business purposes, but there may be some costs involved nonetheless. Uh, are there sub substantial costs and who's bearing them? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we haven't been too worried about costs. We're happy to do donate our time and, and costs. Uh, I think, obviously, to the extent that those become highly material, I think that, you know, the state and the city hopefully will, will also contribute. But frankly, we, we haven't been worried about that. We're happy to make financial contributions as necessary to the extent that they become highly substantial. Obviously, we're going to go back both in the, 
in the past stimulus bill, as well as the one that President elect Biden is talking about. There are funds for uh, vaccination distribution. But as again, we, we kind of want to jump in this. We'll worry about the costs uh, later. We got to put the processes in place first. Yeah, it's way too early uh, because you're still putting it together, as I understand it. But but uh, is there a possibility of Honeywell doing something similar to this in other communities around the country? Oh, absolutely. That, that's the whole objective. I mean, we want to start here in Charlotte, but we hope to lend that expertise, create a bit of a playbook. So whether directly or indirectly, we want to learn want to get this up and running and uh, and hopefully do this at, uh, at some of the other facilities. You know, we're proud of the partnership with the Speedway also. There are other Speedways across the country. So, you know, we really want to pilot here in Charlotte. It's probably not going to be perfect day one or wherever mm -hmm. things are. But as we optimize and get this going, we really want to share that knowledge and have this massive vaccinations take place. I, I think we all have a great deal of passion about this because whether we think about our well-being, the health of our citizens, the economic conditions, the faster we can roll out these vaccines, the better off the country will be. That correlation is clear. And, and anything and everything that Honeywell can do, we will do to assist in this effort. And, and everyone wishes you success. And in success, uh, do you think there's a role with the federal government? Have you had any conversations with the incoming Biden administration in success if this works that maybe rolling it out in other places? Yeah, we've had some preliminary discussions, but we anticipate expanding those discussions because obviously, you know, whether this is done at a state level or a federal level, the rollout of the administration of the vaccines currently is being done much more at a state level. But potentially, we could even partner with uh, at a federal level to really make this much more streamlined and efficient, particularly if we can figure out how to do some of these mega vaccination centers where we can literally do thousands upon thousands of people per day. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you're doing this for all the right reasons, I know. At the same time, are there benefits back to Honeywell? How do your people feel about this? What does this do for the culture at Honeywell? Well, we, our people love it. I was just on the phone with our leader uh, who actually leads our supply chain. And I can tell you people at Honeywell are thrilled to do this. And by the way, this is not the first thing we've done in terms of getting through this crisis. If you recall back, David, back in the uh, April, May timeframe, we've created, stood up two manufacturing facilities in the U.S., one in Rhode Island, one in Phoenix, Arizona, to really assist in this effort. We've brought a series of what we call healthy solutions, whether it's the building or aircraft or industrial facilities, as people return to flying again, return to the office buildings. So this is yet another thing that we're trying to do in this COVID era. And, and uh, our people love doing this. They get an extra charge out of being able to help. And it, we're not doing this for financial reasons. We're doing this because it helps the country. Yeah, well, I really appreciate that, Darius. And I, I mean to say, we all wish you success. We're all rooting for you. That's Honeywell CEO Darius Adamchuk. Coming up, it's the largest wholesale mortgage provider in the country, and it looks to be the biggest company to go public through a SPAC when it closes its deal next week. We talk with United Wholesale Mortgage CEO Matt Ishbia. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. The home mortgage business is on fire, having written about $4.4 billion in new mortgages last year. That's $600 billion more than the prior record that way back in 2003. And the company with the biggest share of that booming market is United Wholesale Mortgage, which doubled its mortgage originations last year to over $200 billion. United Mortgage has been a private company, but that's due to change next week when it goes public through a SPAC expected to be the largest ever. And we welcome now its CEO, Matt Ishbia. So great to have you with us. As I say, a fellow Michigander. It's good when Michiganders do well. Give us a sense of what drove this extraordinary market last year. How much of it was people moving out to out of uh, urban centers? How much of it was just low interest rates? What, what really is driving it? Yeah, the mortgage market was really great last year. It's really a combination of a lot of things. Obviously, the Fed buying a lot of mortgage-backed securities, so rates have been low. 30-year fixed rates in the twos, you know, can't get much better if you're doing that. So a lot of people are refinancing, but also it helped with affordability because people could buy houses. And, and, and I think now home means more than it used to with the pandemic. People are in their house for months at a time. They want to live in a house so they have a little bit more space. And so we've seen a lot of people move from urban to suburban. But at the same time, people just realize that home matters more. And so a lot of purchases, and obviously with low rates, the refinancing, 
refinance uh, really spurred a lot of activity. So how sensitive are you to that mortgage rate? Because part of the thing that's driving that is we've got a Federal Reserve that's buying up a lot of mortgage paper. Uh, are you sensitive if that backs off? Does that really hurt your business substantially? You know, everyone's doing great with low rates, right? 30-year fix in the twos is very, very low. But for UWM, our business, we are actually traditionally more of a purchase business. So we're not actually doing as well as everyone else was doing in this refi boom. But we also are a lot less cyclical. So when the purchase market, we're the largest purchase mortgage company in the country. So when the purchase market becomes a thing, that's actually when we're going to gain market share. So we kind of win in both markets in that respect. So I don't understand your business, and you can explain a bit to me. How are you getting the margins you're getting? Because the numbers I've seen are just astronomical. You know, it's all about, you know, finding great mortgage brokers. So we work with mortgage brokers. Findmortgagebroker.com. There's a lot of great mortgage brokers. It's the cheapest, fastest, easiest way to get a mortgage. And so what we're really big on is helping advocate for them and help educate consumers that the best way to get a mortgage is go through them. And you get great partners. And, and you, you know, all the margins are good in general. That's a, a really a part of the rates. But the reality is the long-term focus is the cheapest, fastest, easiest way to get a mortgage through a mortgage broker. And we're really big proponents of that. And that's going to help us grow going forward. Well, uh, that's my question about the growth, because your growth has been extraordinary. I think you're the fastest gr growing mortgage broker. Uh, now, mortgage company in the country. Uh, is that why you're going public? No, that's not why we're going public. What we really think going public is going to really, you know, we've been competing and we've been competing in a, a really big market for years. I, I, you know, I've been here 18 years. The company's been in business 35 years. I went from 12 people to 8,000 people. And we've been competing with the biggest lenders in the country. Now we're going to have a level playing field. Give us access to the same resources, same capital structures. Now we can actually put fuel to the fire of our growth. So we think it's like the launching off path to take our growth to the next level. And not only, right now we're the number two overall mortgage lender, and that's not in the goals. The goal is to become number one, and we're gonna work towards that every single day. So how much do you c compete against the big banks, the Wells Fargo's of this world, the JP Morgan's, the Bank of America's? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think the top five lenders, that's three of the top five, along with us and Rocket Mortgage. So those are the top five mortgage companies. So we compete with them, but it's really our mortgage brokers that are competing with them. And so it's educating consumers and realtors the fastest and best way to get a mortgage is through a broker. And so we're really big on pushing that and, and, and educating people because we know if they go there, then we got a chance to help those consumers. Can you keep this growth rate up? I mean, trees don't grow out of the sky, as they say. Is this possible, man? You know, it depends on how you think of it. The market share growth, absolutely. Now, I can't control that the mortgage market is going to be a three or four trillion dollar year every year. However, the mortgage broker space is which really where we play in. It used to be over 50% of the market. It went down to 14%. Now it's back up to 20 and it's going to go to 30, 35% in the next five years. So our sector is actually growing even if the mortgage market goes down. So the answer, short answer is yes, we can continue to grow, especially if you're looking at market share perspective. Uh, so Rocket Mortgage, isn't it located in Michigan as well? Yeah, they're about 20 minutes from us. Okay, so what's going on in Michigan? Why Michigan? You know, I think it's a blue-collar town with a lot of hardworking people. You know, the, the, obviously, it's the Motor City. A lot of people call it the Mortgage City now. There's a lot of access to great. But we have a lot of great, hardworking people here. And, and, and the, the key to our success is our 8,000 people at our company. And so that's what makes us grow. And I'm sure that's a lot to do with Rocket Success and a lot of other, a lot of other great companies in this area. When you talk about mor mortgage brokers, a lot of people get a little nervous thinking back to the 2006, 2007, what that led to. Uh, have we taken care of that risk of people, uh, mortgage brokers now I'm talking about, writing mortgages that shouldn't get written? Absolutely. So to give a lot of credit to the CFPB, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, with Richard Cordray, when he led it, and a lot of different changes they put in place, they basically really stabilized the mortgage industry. So what happened in 07, 08, 09 really can't happen again. And it's not just mortgage brokers. It was everybody in the, in the market. And so mortgage brokers were the best way to get a mortgage back then. A lot of things changed, and now they still are today. And so that's really growing again, and that's why we're seeing the growth in that channel. Matt, when we see a company as successful as yours has been with the growth trajectory it's had, uh, we often start to ask ourselves, are they going to diversify? Are they going to other areas uh, to compete because you're going to occupy so much of the mortgage business? Are you thinking about adjacent businesses you need to be in? You know, one of the benefits of being public is we have access to look at other things. But the reality is, you know, we try to dominate in our sector, which is the wholesale mortgage space. We still think there's a lot of growth. Not only, you know, we're 35 to 40 percent of our of our wholesale channel, but the channel is going to grow. And so we're going to focus on that. But we also have a lot of cash now and a lot of access to capital where we can look at opportunities, whether it's adding on things, investing further in tech. We have over a thousand technology. We're, we're really a technology company, closing loans. We close loans in 17, 18 days when everyone else takes 45, 50 days. 
days. And so the investment in technology is probably more where we're going to go, more than you know other biz businesses or other industries. We're really focused on wholesale mortgage, dominate with technology, make the process faster, easier, and cheaper. But but that sounded a little bit like you're going to be looking around for some acquisitions. You know, we have access to do that. We look at it, but we build almost everything from technology perspective. But we, we have our eyes open. We have access to cash. Once again, it's a level playing field now. You know, now, now give us a chance to compete head to head. We're going to continue to take market share. Okay, Matt, really great to talk to you. Good luck next week as you close that deal. That's United Wholesale Mortgage CEO, Matt Ishbia. Coming up, we welcome our regular political contributor, Jeannie Shangeno of Iona College. But this time, we're in a different role as author of the new book, American Democracy in Crisis. In the meantime, a, no a headline is crossing the Bloomberg right now. It just as happened, we knew it was coming, but it still is sad. The total number of COVID-19 deaths globally has now passed the mark of 2 million. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Jeannie Sean Zeno is professor of political science at Iowa College. And of course, she is our regular political contributor here on Bloomberg. But in between all of that, she's managed to write a new book, which could not be more timely. It's entitled American Democracy in Crisis, The Case for Rethinking Madisonian Government. And she's here now to tell us all about it. So, Jeannie, first of all, congratulations. Great to have you on about this. Let's start with the most basic thing. I mean, we tend to think over the last two or three weeks we've had a crisis here. But I'm not sure that's the crisis necessarily you were writing about when you set out to write this book. No, it's not. And thank you so much for having me. Um, it's certainly a relevant crisis, but I'm talking about sort of a, a crisis in American government that has been going on for several, several decades, which is the inability of the federal government in particular to act in critical situations and to address key problems. So you had just mentioned before the break that COVID deaths have passed 2 million. And one of the things that got me really moving on this book over the last year was how long it took Congress and the executive branch to agree finally right after Christmas under pressure to pass a second COVID relief, mess, you know, a COVID relief bill in the midst of a pandemic that's had such devastating consequences. So that's what I'm talking about, why we can't, why our government doesn't get things done. There's a long list of things that you mentioned in the book where people across the country of any political situation just don't feel our government is getting done what we need to get done. Why are you picking on James Madison then, though? Well, the reason I'm picking on poor Madison is he is the father of our Constitution, and of course his goal was to set up a system that protected liberty, which at that time mainly meant property. And if your goal is to protect liberty, the first thing you do is divide power so nobody can come together in the governmental sector to impede on your liberty. And he did that beautifully. But what he didn't think about was that 240 years later, not everybody may agree that liberty protection is the only goal of government. And that's the situation we find ourselves in repeatedly, right? You have supporters of, say, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, Donald Trump, and others who think merely protecting liberty isn't what they want the government to do. So that's where I think we have to have a concerted sort of national conversation. What do people think the goal of the government should be? You know, two things I talk about are being more responsive and more accountable. Um, and so if those things are important, we have a system that's not achieving those. Various people through the years, including my old law partner, Lloyd Cutler, have proposed various reforms, many of which would require amending the Constitution. One of the things our founders did, including James Madison, is make that awfully difficult to do. Are there things, practical things, that we could get done short of amending the Constitution? There are, and of course, you, you know I was thrilled to hear you worked for Lloyd Cutler because he plays a key role in this book for me. But there are many things that, that can be done. Um, you know, if you think there is a problem that the government is not responsive enough to key challenges, one thing would be to use our regular amendment process, but it's unlikely to result in much because it hasn't over the years. We've only had two real structural reforms in our 240-year history via amendments. The other avenue is an Article 5 constitutional convention, which rightly so many people fear, particularly in this environment. And so the third avenue is really what we think of as extra constitutional remedies. These are things that our framers, right after they constructed the system, turned to. And that's things like responsible parties, electoral reform, 
institutional changes like getting rid of the filibuster, reforming the veto power. So there's a whole set of reforms and remedies that have been talked about. Most of them coalesce around the idea that you want to diminish the divisions in government. So Roy Cutler, your former boss, talked about one that I think is, is important, which is allowing the president to choose a percentage of his cabinet or her cabinet from Congress. That revision would incentivize the executive and the legislative branches to work together in a more concerted fashion. Those are the kinds of changes that we're talking about. Yeah, and one of the refreshing things about your book is it makes it not ad hominem, because you say it's not about the people necessarily, it's about the system. Yeah, and, and that was sort of my working title. It's it's the system, stupid. So, and all <laughs> due apologies to James Carville. Um, and they wouldn't let me title it that for obvious reasons. But yeah, absolutely, we have a tendency in in a, you know all of our lives, and certainly in the media, we yeah. do this to focus on the individual. When the real argument is to what we think of as upstreaming in health policy, and focus on the system. And that's what I try to get people to do. It's not quite as exciting, but it's certainly more important because, as we've seen in our lifetimes, you can change people, but it doesn't change the system. Right. It's an important and timely book, as I say. Thank you so much. That's American Democracy in Crisis, written by the new author, again, Bloomberg political contributor, of course, Jeannie Sean Zeno. And coming up, we're going to have a second hour of Balance of Power on Bloomberg Radio. We'll talk with AFL-CIO President Richard, Richard Trumka and Carly Fiorina. And this is Bloomberg.